we're very pleased to welcome him back. So over to you, Wenting. Okay. Great. So, hello everyone. I'm Wenting. Um, oh, what happened? Okay. Great. Uh, I will restart. <laughs> sure. So, hello everyone. I'm Wenting. Welcome to the Boston area and another year of LatchUp. I'm here to present my latest project in the broader theme of open source silicon, the caster. As you can see in the title, it's an open source ink display controller IP. So first of all, just a little bit about myself. I'm currently a full-time digital IC designer at Zero ASIC right here in the Cambridge. And I'm also a part-time MSE student at Tufts University. In the past, I've done things like um, a Game Boy re-implementation or Super Scalar Risk of Five cores. Oh, no. Um, and among other non-IPJ projects. Um, so let's get into today's topic, which is Ink Controller. Let me just give you some backgrounds. So Ink is actually a brand name of uh, a family of paper-like electrophoretic displays. It was invented here in MIT Media Lab decades ago. Nowadays, they're commonly used in e-readers, electronic shelf labels. You've probably seen them on Kindles or in the stores or maybe in some train stations as well. The basic concept isn't hard to understand. In the simplest form, uh, you have charged particles with different colors dispersing some oil in some uh, kind of, I need to hold it, <laughs> transparent container. By applying electric fields, uh, these particles can be moved up and down to change the colors or you know, create a mixture of colors. Of course, turning this concept into actual mass-produced products is no small feat, but that's outside the scope of my work, so I wouldn't dig into that today. Uh, in terms of display quality, um, they are no match for modern IPS LCDs. Pretty much worth everything, and it's more expensive. Then why would anyone bother with them? It has few advantages. Um, it reflects a light instead of emitting lights. So it generally consumes less power, and it can be used outdoors. Uh, it's, that doesn't even work. Um, it's also bistable, means it retains the image after the power has been removed. Like the one I have in my hand, it, Obviously, it's not connected, but still showing the image. Um, but for me, like the different, biggest differentiating factor between e-ink and other is it's like paper. So we have many other reflective or bistable display technologies like the ones I listed here. They are all interesting displays on their own, but none of them feel like paper. OK, now, so now I have got my hand on some of the shelf ink screens. I would like to do some project with it, uh, maybe an ink laptop. So how do I drive these screens? Turns out, just like LCDs, there are screens with integrated controller and screens without. Those has controllers typically expose a standard spy interface. The controller takes care of the, all the fine details, and I just need to send an image as I want to display. Simple and easy. Um, sounds good, right? Not really. There are some limitations with such screens. So basically, they are slow. The spy interface is slow to begin with, and their integrated controller is just not designed for high-speed operation, like illustrated on the left. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these screens are bad. They make a lot of sense for what they are designed for, which is electronic shelf labels. Uh, in these kind of applications, you don't really care about like refresh time or the latencies. Um, it doesn't really matter, but the cost should be low. A screen with spy interface can be interfaced with uh, different sorts of microcontrollers easily. That's all that matters for them. They are also good for DIY projects, like uh, calendars on the right, uh, but they are just not good fit for an e-ink laptop. So that, that leaves me with the other type of screen, those without integrated controllers. For these screens, the input goes directly into shift registers, just dump shift registers so you don't get any other processing latency. That's cool, but how do I use the screen? The screen still needs a controller. It's just outside of screen. Um, there are many system the chips um, that with e controllers built in, e have also worked with chip vendors to produce external controller chips. Can I just use one of them? O of course not, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, they are all designed for e-readers and they are just too slow for a laptop. The viable way to move forward is then to use a high performance uh, system on the chip coupled with external controllers through some uh, proper high bandwidth veto interface, then connect that controller to the screen. Uh, when I started this project, I couldn't find any existing sub, uh, suitable controller chip or design, so I designed my own, named the caster. Um, that's a long introduction just on why I even attempt to do this thing. Now let's take a look at what this controller actually does. The job of the controller is to format the incoming image or video, uh, generate the necessary interface timing so the image would be displayed on the screen, hopefully um, similar to the original image I want to display. 
Starting from the basic concept, you've seen this before, the color of pixel can be changed by applying positive and negative voltages for a finite period of time. From the controller's perspective, um, it's really just depending on the current state or color of the pixel and desired color of pixel, there are four possibilities. The controller just needs to make decision based on the color of each pixel, and that's it. Um, to implement it, the color of each pixel needs to be stored somewhere. So a buffer memory is added with DMAs moving data in and out of it. There's also a timer so it doesn't underdrive or overdrive the pixel. And now we have an in controller. Uh, and it actually works. But it only supports binary black and white. That's what I've coded for. No grayscale in between, so it couldn't quite display pictures or anti-alias text yet. There could be mitigate in two different ways. One is I actually add another dithering step in the image processing pipeline. So it will dithering the input image to be binary only. It doesn't look too good either, but uh, better than nothing. Another way is to let the screen itself display some shades of gray. The basic idea is also easier to understand. By underdriving the pixel, uh, it would not finish the color transition, but rather staying at some level of gray sh shade in the middle. Uh, on the right is a proof of concept I did many years ago using this method and showing it actually works. The sequence used in commercial displays or devices is a little more involved than just simply underdriving it. So avoid to avoid coding complex control logic, uh, what people usually do is they do a lockup table called the waveform table. The controller used the same information as before to lock up the table, uh, but then the table will tell controller should it apply positive voltage, negative voltage, or common voltage, which is zero volt. The content of the table is provided by e-ink, so as a user, I don't really need to worry about the, f the fine details too much. Implementation-wise, it's even easier. I just replace all the logic with another lockup table, and I'm done, like an FPGA inside of FPGA. Um, I'm serious, at this stage, I could already do most of the things a commercial e-ink controller can do. By changing the content of that lookup table on the fly, you can do things like clearing the screen, switching between binary or mo uh, grayscale mode, uh, and all trading off between the contrast ratio and the frame rate. This is actually an important one. Uh, if you don't know already, e-ink is slow. If we say a full transition takes 10 frames to complete at 60 hertz, uh, it will basically ignore any input in this 10 frame window. So it can only display up to six images per second. That's six FPS. This is good enough for an e-reader, but horrible for an e-ink laptop. Um, so ink monitors on the market right now, or they have something called the high refresh rate technology. That's really just a dial you can switch to intentionally underdrive the screen. Not for grayscale, but to improve the frame rate. So we can get like 15 to 20 FPS on these monitors at the cost of lower contrast, uh, low to like 5 to 1. Uh, to be honest, 15 to 20 is not good either, but this is what's possible. So am I done then? Of course, no. I'm, I can do better. Uh, some commercial e-ink controllers found on e-readers support something called multiple region update. Uh, imagine the user is typing and the, the user types letter A followed by the letter B, say, 50 milliseconds later. With the basic controller, the letter B wouldn't be start to be displayed until like A is fully displayed, so we just wasted 100 milliseconds there. Um, B doesn't need to wait for letter A because they are on different regions or different parts of the screen. Uh, the reason it was waiting was because they are sharing a global counter, a global timer to make sure it doesn't overdrive, underdrive, these kind of things. I decide to simply move the timer counter value into the part of pixel state stored alongside with other color information because I have a large DDR memory. Uh, effectively, each pixel is now on its own region now. This improves the typing experience by a lot. But it, this approach is still not perfect. Say if I type the letter A, that was a typo, so I need to delete and then type letter B instead. In a naive implementation, I need to wait for the A to fully appear, wait to fully disappear, then I wait for the B to appear. That's just a lot of time. Uh, but now, as I have a local timer, it's now possible to just use a timer value to immediately inverse the half-displayed letter A. With this, the typing is actually quite smooth right now, though I couldn't really show you me typing because you have to feel yourself. So what I do is I put a clip of Bad Apple playing. The latency is minimum, even comparing to an LCD side by side. So now I've beaten the competition. Am I done? Um, not really. Actually, using this monitor, like myself in my daily work, revealed more issues. Let's just take a very quick look. Um, 
one particular issue is that moving the mouse cursor too fast caused it to disappear, basically. Like, you see I'm moving it and it just disappear. The screen couldn't just catch up. Um, the, the fix, to fix it, I tried simply adding some logic to ensure each pixel is driven for at least two to three frames. Turns out that's a quite effective fix. Um, another bigger issue is the grayscale mode is simply not usable. Getting grayscale image on e-ink is actually a sophisticated process, much slower than binary, and it shows flashing images during the process. So how does everyone else get away with this slow grayscale issue? Um, on e-readers, this is actually not a big issue. The software, can, the software knows what to do, so it can switch between fast and slow modes depending on the user action. Um, the e-reader software, because they have full control, they can simply say, oh no, we don't support scrolling, you have to do page flipping. Um, and then what's being done on the existing e-ink monitors, when they don't have control of the software, they throw the problem back to the user. Um, the user simply have to accept that the update is going to be slow, latency is going to be horrible, and the process flashing. I mean, it's just a price you have to pay uh, for better image quality, so I did the same thing initially. Uh, saying maybe I can f work with that, but I, I can't use it. I have to do better. So what I come up with is allowing it to switch between the fast binary mode and slow grayscale mode automatically on a per pixel basis. When the input image is changed, it is switched to the binary mode and do the update. When the image hasn't changed for a while, um, it just re-renders image in grayscale. This is a quite extreme demo. Usually you don't do this when you're using e-ink, uh, so the pro updating process looks a bit chaotic. Uh, but with this hybrid mode implemented, at least personally, I find it to be quite usable. Uh, so I've been talking about the features and its theory of operation. Now let's take a quick look at the whole design and implementation as well. The design has been implemented on the Silent Spartan 6 FPGA, which happened to be the same device I used for my f first latch up talk. Um, the, at the moment, it uses only 2.6 K-LOTs and can be clocked up to 70 megahertz, providing a 280 megapixel processing speed. Um, if I extend it to 8 white, currently it's 4 white design, uh, it basically just doubles. There is no like dependency chains. Uh, in the board level, I've added more external components to make it a complete monitor. It supports both USB-C and DVI input. Uh, I have bridges for video interfaces so FPGA can receive. I also add a RP2040 microcontroller um, just for all the housekeeping items such as bitstream loading, decoder initialization, USB communication, USB-C, all these kind of stuff. In the actual layout, there are a few more things compared to the previous abstract block diagrams. There are many power supply chips for both e-ink and FPGA. The USB-C input is also more than just a display port and a new connector. Like the, the device actually needs to tell, tell the computer it's a monitor, it's not any other USB-C device. It'll also need to mux between using a high-speed mux to choose the right la data lanes you're using because you can plug in in two different ways or you can swap two ends. It's actually need to be figured out, not just automatically works. I've also designed enclosure using FreeCAD and 3D printed. I did find some issues in the design, uh, so I still need to iterate on it. Uh, but So the end result is I have this fully functional e-ink monitor that's more usable than anything else currently on the market. All the source code, including the RTL, microcontroller firmware, or the PCB design, enclosure design, they are all open on GitLab. Feel free to take a look or reach out to me. Hopefully, one day I can also make it into an e-ink laptop. So thanks for listening, and I will take questions now. Outstanding, Wenting. That's really good. Uh, we've probably got time for five minutes of questions, actually. So um, I have a quick one. What's the API uh, from the kind of driver graphics library? I'm, I don't know much about this, but like, what, have you tapped off at like a standard API level that you're there? Yeah, that's that's a. A standing issue. So if we do have an API so the application can tell the display controller what it's intending to do, there are much more to be uh, could be done. Uh, for now, I opt to have like just no API. So the display controller just try to figure out what's being done uh, based on the input image. Uh, I do have like a USB interface with a sort of API implement there, but no software has been written. Okay, good question. Oh, we got one here. I would just shout it out. Uh, what's, what's the API for, um, or sorry, what's the interface? Uh, 
What's the interface into the uh, display? Uh, the interface into the display, it's basically a raw shift to register interface. So you expect like a data bus and then a clock, then a latch, so a latch in the data. Yeah. Yes. So, sorry, one thing. So the question is, what's the power consumption versus a normal e-ink controller and a LC, LC, LED? USB LCD display. Yes. So for now, it's sitting about two watts when in continuous operation. It doesn't drop too much when it's not in use. Um, so the main issue is it need to like keep refreshing the DDR, keeps in accepting incoming. So it's lower than a, like just you say a USB LED monitor, which typically consume five to ten watts but it's still higher than an uh, e-reader, because e-reader, it, no, it has a software control, it can shut it down when it's not used, so it's zero watt when it's not in use. So when something changes on the screen, do you have to refresh the whole screen? Is there no way to incrementally change just the parts that changed? Uh, you, the, you have to scan the entire screen, but you can choose not to apply voltages, so it stays intact. So when is there going to be an ASIC version of this? <laughs> yeah, for e-ink, are they rated for any number of changes? Or how long could you use this display with a lot of uh, quick updates before it might go bad as some electronic components do. Yes, so it's rated for typically like 10K to 100K updates. Um, so depending on how you use it, for example, I don't really intend any user to watch videos on it. But if you do, uh, the screen would go bad quickly. But if you're just using it to do PDFs, reads, that's fine. Thank you. All right, we'll call it there. Thank you very much, Winting. Great presentation. Thanks for coming by.